one day a poor man been walking in the field of winter time. The weather stand very cold, and the ground been freeze hard. When sundown come, he pity axe and he hoe upon his shoulder, and he start for going home, cause him been a walk hard, and he bone weary, and he hungry all too. He house there before him, but he stand far up, and when he look upon the smoke to rise out the chimney, and see the fire shine through the window, he know so he wife to cook little for him, and he know he house to be warm when he reach him. See him look at that fire and that smoke to call him home for he rest, and he had glad till he have a sing as he gwine. This as he get most out the field, he see a black submanara stretch out across the path. When he sham at the first, the man think him been dead stick, but when he look again, he see this snake, and he froze stiff. Richard Lofton and I entered into each other's lives in the summer of 1936. Without either of us really intending to, I believe, his feeling for the marshes and the swamps and the waterways in that little town, McClellanville, where his ancestors had lived for nine generations, he took me down to the low country of South Carolina where he had grown up and I realized again the depth of his feeling about this incredibly beautiful country. His feeling for the marshes and the swamps and the waterways. Richard Lofton had painted and drawn these people almost since he could walk. One of the first paintings which really encouraged him to paint was a lovely painting of the Gullah Negress, the woman who had been his nurse. I'm Gerald Wasserman. I'm a painter and was a good friend of Dick Lofton. The first show I ever saw was back in the 50s. Gee, it may have been even in the 40s. He had a show of point, paintings of Point Lobos, and then he had the most marvelous set of works of what they called the Gullah Blacks. The Gullah Negroes lived in the little village of McClellanville alongside the white people. They had all lived together and worked together for several generations. The Gullahs, as I knew them, were very tall, handsome people, almost blue-black, strongly built, and very bright. And the descendants of these people in this present generation have managed their lives extremely well going through colleges and universities and showing their native ability when they had an opportunity to do so. The work that he was doing when I first met him was very impressive. And I thought, this is, this is something that really is worth spending my life with. Oh, he painted all the, that's all he did. Painted all the time. He said, it's very good to paint from nature, he says, good for artists. He says, do you know why? He says, because by the time you set up 
against the wind and the rain and, and carry everything you've got there. He says, you haven't got time for theories. He did a wonderful series of paintings of whale bones. I think he was a very individual painter. We fell in love before too long and we planned to marry. And as soon as I graduated from the University of North Carolina in June of 1938, we were married in Winston-Salem. He was called to active duty in the Army of the United States after our first daughter, Nana, was born in Winston-Salem. But off he went to Fort Ord. We settled very happily into Pacific Grove. He had already established himself in the artistic community on the peninsula and was in touch with people in the Carmel Art Association. He had met, for instance, Edward Weston, who had seen his work and thought, this is, this is a real painter, this is a real man. I'm going to take him out and show him Point Lobos. I was 12 years old when I first met Dick Lofton. I was in studio art supplies in Carmel, Neil Craft Studios, and uh, later on I became an apprentice framer where I got to see him on a regular basis there. His paintings just fascinated me because they were always the boldest and the brightest and the, uh, the, the most different of all the paintings that I, I was seeing as a young kid in Carmel. And I had always hoped that sometime I could figure out, you know, how he did them. And so I would always ask him, when, when later when I was a framer, I'd always ask him, why did you use a violet for a shadow there? Or why did you put this there? And why did you put that blue over there? And uh, he would come in about three o'clock for his coffee at the, at the craft studios there. You have coffee with Gus Ariola and Fred Klepek, the owner of the art supply store and frame shop. And uh, they would have their three o'clock coffee. And he'd also be bringing in a lot of the portraits were being done at the time I was a, a senior in high school. Uh, uh, and he'd be bringing these portraits in, sopping wet, and uh, uh, showing, showing what he'd been doing. And then he'd put them down, some of them to be framed, some of them he was going to frame himself. And uh, I'd always just, I'd just start asking him all kinds of questions about it. And as he had a, he was a chain smoker, so as he had a cigarettes in his mouth, he was talking over the painting. It was very funny to watch because they kept waiting for the, the cigarette ash to fall into the paint, the wet paint. Anyway, it was one of my fondest moments of uh, was being able to exchange with him uh, ideas. I think the whale bone series was one of the strongest in the gullah. And also I love the portraits because I love the people and I know the people in the portraits. Painting seemed to be almost like the breath of life for him. It was the way he approached things, the way he digested things, the way he commented on things the way he understood things. And I remember his comment many times, people whom he painted had said, how did you know that about me? How, how, how come you, you, you caught something that nobody else has ever caught? How come you, you, make, you, you learn so much about me? And he always simply said, all I do is copy nature. It's all there. <laughs> I just thought, well, that's, that's an interesting approach.
So out he goes with Edward Weston to Point Lobus. Edward photographs while Dick is painting, and he thought, this is, this is great. And Armand Hansen took him under his arm and thought, this, yes, this is, this is a real painter. <laughs> Before Armand Hansen died, he took off his light brown, worn corduroy jacket and gave it to Dick saying, all right, this is, this is the master's jacket. I'm passing it on to you. Anyway, it was a catalog. He came to my studio and he threw this catalog from, the, um, from a show of assemblage in San Francisco. And uh, I said, don't you want it? Uh, what? He said, no. And I said, uh, I said, well, what do you think about this? And he says, they'll do anything rather than paint. That's very much like him. He was such, so supportive, he was always there, and he was one of those people, uh, one of those artists that was always there for, for other artists, and uh, he was truly an artist's artist, because uh, when you want to talk about paint or, what, or about the act of painting, painting the, on a two-dimensional surface, he represented it so well as uh, someone that, uh, living in Carmel, where more people were more conservative about their painting, he really went out and boldly did it and did it in, in, a, in a way that was uniquely his. When he'd clean his palette at the end of the day, he'd scrape the stuff. He didn't throw it always throw it away. It was over here, and he could dip into that. And it seemed to me he was dipping. Now this seemed to me it may not be the way that he would dip into that to get more impasto. Maybe this was a grayish lump with uh, several colors, but you know he he took what he wanted anyway, and so this. Those, those late portraits, especially the late portraits, uh, were very, very heavy impasto. Thank you. 
My father was extremely nearsighted, as are his two daughters, and so he developed a kind of rhythm with his painting where he would be painting at the easel, and then he'd walk to the other side of the studio and look back and take his glasses off and, and then go back to the easel and paint some more and then walk back to the other side of the room. And so he sort of had this runway that he would, he would use while he was painting, and the paintings for me, have that quality that comes through for people who have to wear glasses. You don't really see what's in front of you until you get quite far away. There's this kind of blurriness and it all, it all comes together at a, from across the room. And then when you get closer, you become fascinated with the texture that you see and the, the bright colors and the texture. So in some ways, having myopia worked out to be a wonderful benefit for him and it's fun to look at the paintings. Sort of squinting really helps, helps you see what's actually there, and to look at them from a great distance makes them read very well. Landscapes were to him always something to be explored and recorded and cherished and experienced. And he looked at Death Valley and he looked at the Pinnacles and he looked at the Sierra and he looked at the mountains down the coast with great fresh eyes. I think having grown up in the low country of South Carolina, mountains were a great uh, pleasure to him.
He went on a trip to the snow. He painted, I think the last paintings he did, among the last were a trip to the, up in the Sierras. So there are all sorts of treasures still waiting there to be discovered and each time I go through my files I am renewed and delighted at this, this wonderful life he lived. Mm -hmm.